where we were to where we are. I'll give you a couple scriptures even before we start out that I was just thinking of while we're worshiping. One of them in Revelation chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. It says, For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. How many of y'all know the enemy knows his time is short? I'm telling you what, he is trying whatever he can now to, to, to get his point across, to deceive us, to lie to us, to get us to, to fall off. I believe he's even at a point now that he knows in the end times even the elect will be deceived. He knows that in the end times that this is the time that, that he's trying his hardest. This is the time that, that he knows not only the elect will be deceived, but individuals will fall away from God. There'll be a great falling away. But what he doesn't like is that God's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And what he wants to do, I believe, he wants to destroy you before you can get that presence of God being poured out upon you. I believe he's trying to do something in this nation to destroy it. Uh, we're going somewhere we don't normally go on Sunday, so praise the Lord you all are here tonight. <laughs> but, but he's trying to destroy it. He knows his time is short. He knows that, that, that it's limited, that if he wants to kill some people, he's got to do it now because he doesn't have much more time. And this is what he's doing. He's trying to destroy things. He's trying to deceive things. I'm telling you what, there's been, uh, even in this last year, this last six months to a year, uh, there's been plenty of books that, that we've had from good, so we thought good um, Christian authors and different people we had listened to and, and were very, so we thought spiritual, but even the elect's being deceived. There's people, we're just throwing out their books. i got to go through my bookcase because there's plenty in there that I just need to, to throw the books out. Why? Because of their beliefs now. I believe what God's doing right now and in these days is he's revealing what's really there. There's some that have put on a front for so long. Uh, there's some that's, that's been sitting on the fence for so long. I'm even going to say this night. Even our governor has been sitting on the fence for so long. Our governor claims to be one way, but you look at him, and, and in the 90s, if he would have been on the fence like he is today, it would have been okay. Yeah. But we're living in a time we cannot be on the fence. We've got to pick a side and run with it. We've got to do something and say, I'm either for this side or I'm for that. I'm for God or I'm for the enemy. I'm going to do what God's called me to do or I'm going to throw in the towel. Yeah. I mean, even God speaks about it, that if you're lukewarm... I'll vomit you out of my mouth. I'll spit you out. He says, I'm not going to tolerate the garbage. And we've gotten to a place that even the church has got, gotten to a place that I believe God. And, and I preached a sermon on uh, a few years back about um, unveiling what's really there. Unveiling, but God's pulling the, the curtains back. And I believe that, that even in the season that we're living, it may be so chaotic, but I be behind the scenes, God's revealing who's really for him and who's against him. And I believe, listen, I believe that it's going to get even harder even in these next coming months to the next six months to a year maybe that it becomes harder that all of a sudden we come to a place that we see even more things crumble. Listen, that we never experienced or saw before. But what it will begin to do is begin to reveal and separate, separate who calls themselves Christians and who really are. And we're living in a time now, I'm, I'm going to go into even more. I believe that there's going to be a time in America that, that even with the, the tax-exempt status of the church, listen, the tax-exempt status of the church right now, it, I mean, we even saw just recently, they, um, is it the IRS that does that? And what they did is they literally, they rejected someone's 501c3 for starting a church because they said churches are normally for Republicans and we're rejecting that. So if you don't think that we're living in a day that right is wrong and wrong is right, you better wake up. Because we're living in a time that even with, with, with the tax-exempt status of the church, listen, a lot of people give to the church because, not because they're harsh, right, but because they want a tax-exempt status. They need some discounts on their, their taxes. Uh, we've got, I believe God's going to begin to reveal some stuff in it. Listen, this is just me talking here what I think is going to happen. But I believe God's going to reveal some stuff in the church that literally we've already heard politicians 
begin to say this, that if they get into office, that if we don't agree the same way of what the Bible agrees for marriage, that they'll take away our tax-exempt status. And you'll begin to see pastors compromise what they believe for their tax-exempt status. But I believe what God's going to do within that is going to begin to build up men's faith for a new season that we're entering into, that we've got to begin to step out in certain areas and certain, certain things, saying, God, even in our finances, we're putting our trust in you, that who cares if we're not tax-exempt, because our finances don't come from this, it comes from you, God. And it's going to begin to separate who's really a man of Christ and who's not. It's going to begin to reveal things. We're going to look in the natural, going, this is terrible. Look what they're doing. But God's saying, I'm revealing to the church who's really for me and who's against me. I'm revealing to the church who, who really is taking a stand and who isn't. And I believe there'll be pastors that begin to say, well, uh, we're going to have to start changing a few of the things that we believe just so we can keep this. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could have easily... Well, if you don't know the story, go home, look it up, go on Google, you can figure it out. Go back to some previous messages on YouTube. But, but they had an opportunity to get before all the people, get before the rulers, and they could have just bowed down and said, well, God knows our heart. We're not really bowing down. What we're doing is just coming to a place that, that we want to, God understands that we need to live. How, how are we going to minister the gospel if... If, if we don't compromise this, God will know. God is looking for a people that will stand out in faith and stand up for what they believe in no matter what it is. They went up there and said, guess what? We're going through the fire even if it kills us. And if God wants us to stay to do something, we're going to live through it. And it's the same way that, that happened with Peter. Peter is going to get, he's afraid that he's going to go to the cross with Jesus. What does he do? He denies Jesus three times, even after Jesus warned him. Our nation is going crazy. I've talked to other people in other countries. Their countries are going crazy. You know what they've told me? They've said that because of the administration that's in office right now, that their country knows that they can get away with whatever they want, and they're doing it. Under any other administration we've ever had, listen, under any other administration, I'm not normally political, but, but this is getting to a point. Listen, uh, uh, under any other administration, they've known that they couldn't get away with certain things, so it's kept them into a certain state without pushing the limits or pushing the lines because of it. But now these other countries are going crazy and chaotic, and they have no one to turn to to protect them. We're not even going to go into the Taliban and all that right now. You can look that up. But go with me to Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 29. Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 29. If you don't know where Genesis is, close your Bible and then open it up to the first chapter. And in the first book, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. I love that. What do you want? He said, I want some people that are made like me. I want to create some people that I can love and I can have a relationship with, one that we can communicate back and forth. I love we're the only, uh, only creature that can actually talk. There's others that can mimic things, that can say a few words, but not hold a conversation. We're the only creature that can literally have conversations with God. Why? Because we were created in his image. It says, and let them, I love it. He didn't just say, let them, let them look like us. But he said, and let them have power too. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. And in the image of God created him. It says male and female created them. It says, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it. That always got me there, replenish the earth. He didn't say plenish the earth, he said replenish it. Think about that one for a minute. It says, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, 
Behold, I have given you every herb. Listen, I have given you every herb yielding what? Seed. It says, which is upon the face of the earth and every tree in which the fruit of the tree yielding what? Seed. To you it shall be for food. But let's stop for a minute and think about this. He creates us in his image. But, but we know before he created us in his image, he created everything that we needed to live. He didn't just create us to go, well, now we've got to figure out a plan for them to live. He created everything beforehand, everything that God put in place, everything that he did up until this time was for you and me. Everything that he put in place, I mean, I'm telling you, the stars, the, the sun, the moon, everything. He goes and says, they're going to need to eat. He's preparing these days just to create you. It wasn't he threw us out there and go, well, good luck with everything. He said, you know what? I'm going to go even further. Not only am I going to give them oxygen to breathe, not only am I going to give them all these things, not only are there going to be animals and there's going to be uh, this and that. He's like, I'm going to make sure they, they can eat. I'm going to make sure that they even have dominion, power over everything else that I've created. I love them so much, they're going to have power over everything else. And he gives it to us. But then we get to a place, I think it's crazy, we get to a place that all of a sudden we don't think God wants us to have that power. We don't think God, wa- I'm telling you, he's given us power over our sickness. Right. He's given power over the fish in the sea. I told you about Charles Capps. They said he goes out and casts his line. Every time he does, he casts it out there and says, you've given me dominion over the fish. How many of y'all ever go hunting and you say, I got dominion over you, dear. Get over here, I want a clean shot. Think about it. This is what he said, though. You're killing this deer to eat. I've given you dominion over. I've given you power over. I've done these things, and I've given it all. But what happened was, is there was a fall. There was a fall that that Adam and Eve, they, they, they had sin in them. Things happened, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Just hold your thoughts there. Because that doesn't keep us back from what he's given us. He told us how to survive. He gave us the ability to survive, power, and authority to do it. Now listen, what if it gets to a place in our country that it becomes like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that we have to do something that comes against what we believe in, what our Bible says, in order to eat, in order to survive. You know where our, our, our church culture has gone today? Well, pastor, you know, my kids, they got to eat. And I've got to do this for my kids. My, God will understand my kids have to eat. I'm telling you what. Why is it, again, we have more faith in our government to provide for my kids to eat when my God loved me so much that he prepared a way before he ever created me that I could eat and my kids could eat. Because he even says to go out, he says to have children to replenish earth. He knew we'd have kids. He knew they'd need to eat. He knew there'd have to be a way. So he goes on even in more in a few minutes. We'll talk about this, of what we need to do. Actually, let's go into it now. Jeremiah chapter 29, 5 through 9. So God's prepared a way. He's given us all this. He's given us authority over everything. He's given us not only fruit, but he said, I'm giving you fruit with seeds in it so that you can multiply what I've given you. There's a time for to, 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 to sow. There's a time to reap and so forth. How many of y'all there? Jeremiah 29, 5 through 9. I love this. This scripture has been, been going through my head for the past couple weeks, and I just have to share it. It says, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. How many of y'all got gardens? Oh. <laughs> he told us, build houses. How many of y'all have somewhere you live? We live under something, under a roof. It says build houses and dwell in them. So, so why is it pretty much all of us have missed the second part? We've listened. We want a roof over our head. But then he says plant gardens and eat their fruit. But we're relying on somebody else to plant the gardens. 
and we'll eat their fruit. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of what you've made. And this is where my point's going tonight. It goes on to say, take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so they may bear fruit. Bear, they may bear. Bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. It says, and seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets, listen to this, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in the midst deceive you. Oh, Don't let the prophets that are in the midst of you deceive you. Here's the thing that we heard back in February or back in December, November, October, January. What did we hear all the prophets say? The so-called prophets. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. I'm not going to judge them right now. But what all of them said is that Trump will be in office. Now, here's the deal. Listen. If God speaks something to you, and you believe it was from God, stand on it even when it looked like it didn't come to pass. You stand on it even when it looks impossible. And if you truly believe God told you that Trump will become president, then keep standing on it because just because it looks like it's over doesn't mean it's over. And if you don't, start keeping your mouth shut. But it says... I mean, it literally tells us here, stop listening to these prophets. Why do you keep listening? He said, I told you, you build houses, dwell them, plant gardens, eat their fruit. Then he goes on to say, let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst, don't let them deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. It says, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Now listen. Could Trump get in power? He could. Maybe not. He may not. But what I'm saying is, is we've heard so much wishy-washy stuff going on within the church. I mean, how does it look like to those of the world that's looking to the church going, well, he said it was. Now they say it won't. Now they say they missed it. Now they said this. Oh, we look like we're crazy. I mean, I, if I didn't know God personally, I don't know if I'd want to follow after what we call the church today. But, but he goes on, he's saying, don't let them deceive you. And I'm telling you today, here's what the next word the, the prophets are saying today. They're all saying things are getting ready to turn around. Things are getting ready to break. It's going to be awesome for America. God's going to do this and do that and set you free. Could he? Of course he could. You know what I believe right now? I believe it hasn't been determined yet. God knows it, but I believe it hasn't been determined. Anytime we look back in history, when God needed to come through, what happened? It was all based on the obedience of the people. You know what we saw in, during the, the year of COVID 2020? What did we see? We saw everybody preach and everybody talk. Everybody talked about... to. Uh, They, they all talked about how we've got to repent of our way, turn of our evil ways, and repent and seek the face of God, and he'll heal our land. We've heard them all talk about it, but who's done it? Everybody's proclaimed it. Everybody said it. Everybody shouted it. They've shouted from the rooftops, but that's all they've done is they've been an action out of their mouth, but not in their heart. When nothing changes in the heart of people, I'm telling you what, God continues to allow things to happen so it finally gets people to a place that they stop talking about repenting and they truly start repenting. And I believe we're in a place right now in a situation that the next season hasn't yet been determined because where the people are haven't committed one way or another. What does that mean? They're lukewarm. Could God have spoken to people? Of course he could. He may have. But right now, everybody I'm hearing is all just rejoicing about this next season. And what if it hasn't been determined yet and everybody starts giving up before the time because they think it's going to be great? What if it's not great? Listen, I have hope for a great future. But what if 
the next season isn't great for us? What if tomorrow everything turns around even worse? How many of y'all have seen some garbage in the past six months? The past year and a half, we've seen some stuff we knew would come, but we didn't see it would unroll so quickly. And we've gotten to a place today that all of a sudden we're like, here's the church today. Well, I'm just putting it in God's hands. That means jack. It means nothing. I'm putting it in God's hands. Does that mean that you're listening to God when he tells you what to do? Or are you saying, God, it's in your hands and you're forsaking him? Because, oh, I've left it in God's hands. That's the most commonly used phrase in the church that they do nothing with. It just comes out of their mouth as a saying. Yeah. Kind of like when the church people say, oh, we'll pray for you. Do, are you really praying or is it just, I hope you feel better? I got convicted of that before. Do you know what I do so much now? Let's pray right now. Right. Why? I know I'm going to forget by the time I get home. If I don't write it down, I'll probably forget. Or, you know, I'll tell somebody, hey, you know what, text me. Because I know sometimes I'll forget. I get busy, things happen. Two weeks later, somebody comes, hey, let me give you a praise report. Thank you so much for praying for me. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, praise the Lord. I like to pray for you right there. Uh, I, we did outreaches at my old church years ago. I'm telling you what, we were sitting there at the Sam's Club. They were letting us hand out a... Sodas. We hand out sodas and sodas to people, waters, and all of a sudden we get people that are there and they said, Yeah, if you don't mind, if you can pray for this, I'm like, let's do it, let's pray. And they're like, Oh, right now? Well, yes, let's do it. In my, my health club I owned, people would say, Hey, you know what? If you don't mind, will you pray for this? Yeah, let's pray. Oh, oh, right here? <laughs> yeah, right here. Where else would you want to do it at? <laughs> let's pray. God wants the glory. But I'm telling you what, God's telling us, stop listening to the false prophets. Stop listening to all these things, the dreams which you said that you've had and this and that. He said, build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat their fruits. Do what I'm commanding you to do and watch how it'll work out. He's basically saying, be obedient. Then we start looking at the seed. That makes me sick. Have you all ever seen seedless grapes? Seedless watermelon, seedless this, seedless that. I refuse to eat it. I refuse to buy it. I mean, as a kid, we loved seeds. I mean, you'd flick them at your neighbor, your, you know, your little sister. You'd spit the watermelon seeds out of your mouth. I mean, that was having fun as a kid. Seeing how far they go. But now we just, the convenience of things. Well, we sell out because of the convenience. But I love over and over in Scripture, multiple times he continues to say, eat their fruit. He continues to say, There's talk about their seed. The seed, the seed, the seed. I mean, we, we saw it back in Genesis 1 where he's talking about the seed. Over and over again, he begins to talk about the seed. But, but here's the deal. Most of the seed in America, listen, it's patent. Yeah. Right. Most of it's made by Monsanto. And, and you'll see the signs, this patent number, that patent number, all these different things. I'm going to read you something here. It says, the agricultural giant Monsanto has sued hundreds of small farmers in the United States in recent years in attempts to protect its patent rights on genetically engineered seeds that it produces and sells. A new report says, it says, the study produced jointly by the Center of Food Safety and the Save Our Seeds campaign groups has outlined what it says in a concerted effort by the multinational to dominate the seed industry in the U.S. and prevent farmers from replanting crops that have been produced from Monsanto seeds. It goes on to say, in its reports called Seed Giants versus U.S. Farmers, the CFS said it had tracked numerous lawsuits that Monsanto had brought against farmers and had found some 142 patent infringement suits against 410 farmers and 56 small businesses. Now, this was several years ago, this report. It says in more than 27 states. In total, the firm has won more than $23 million from its targets. The report said many of the, listen, even many of these I was reading were in Missouri. Quite a few were towards the Kansas City area and so forth. That, that they've continued to control their seed. They have genetically altered the seeds that grow our food. You ever wondered why? But here, 
Here, now listen, we're going to get into more of this, but here's what we've done, and I'm using this for an example. Here's what we've done in our nation, even in the church and in our culture, is the enemy takes things and makes it look good so you'll receive it, and then we think it's good, and then in the end, they're able to use it against us. So what happens if we start having seedless everything, and then all of a sudden the seed is controlled by someone, and we can't buy seed unless we do what we've been told to do? We can't plant gardens and grow them and multiply the seed because there is no seed. But it's been genetically altered to, to, to do these very things. And we think, wow, seedless this and seedless this. That's great. We don't have seeds anymore. We don't have to worry about picking through it. Do all this. But there's a plan behind everything. I mean, look at the, the enemy, the plan that he's been having, even to where we're at today, the plan that they've had behind so many different things. They've had these plans. They have genetically altered the seeds that grow our fruit. You ever wonder why? Let me tell you a few of the reasons. One of the reasons they've genetically altered the food, they'll tell you, is because of Roundup. So what they've tried to do with how many of y'all heard of Roundup? What they've tried to do with Roundup, listen, is they've tried to take Roundup to spray it on the plants and, and allow it to kill the, the weeds but not the plant. But they couldn't figure out a way to get that to work. But what they were able to do was alter our plants that we produce fruit from so that now they can be genetically altered to withhold the roundup that's being put on them so now that's being changed in such a way that it'll take the poison in and not kill the plant what's it doing i think it's taken in that poison it's taken in so much stuff that it wasn't designed to take it in the first place roundup kills weeds they try to change things but they have to change the plant rather than the Roundup. GMOs, genetically modified organisms. There are living organisms whose genetically, genetic material has been artificially manipulated. I love the word manipulated there. In a laboratory through genetic engineering. This creates a combination of plants, animals, bacteria, and virus genes that do not occur in nature or through traditional crossbreed methods and even with this a lot of people have a gluten allergy what's it from genetically altered stuff my mother her her she she has an allergy to the gluten but it's not the gluten it's because they've genetically altered it so much that that it begins her body can't accept it and can't take it but they've done these things and it's slowly slowly killing us so they can make money and then we go back to scripture and god said to build houses and live in them, to plant gardens and eat of their fruit. The seedless. They've taken a seed in the lab and altered it to not create seed. We're supporting them. Listen, when we buy this stuff, I believe we're supporting them in controlling the seed. What are seeds for? So we can reproduce what God has given them. They want full control. I mean, this is even coming down to the day of the mark of the beast. I mean, what's happening? They're figuring out ways to control everything, to control everything we have so we can't. I mean, the enemy is thought far ahead. The enemy is, has done this for years and years and years, all preparing for what is to come because he knows what? His time is short. We don't think we can just buy seed and plant it. It says, in 1980, the U.S. Supreme Court, in a 5-4 to four decision, turned seeds into widgets, laying the groundwork for a handful of corporations to begin taking control of the world's food supply. Up until 1980, they couldn't patent seeds. Farmers who buy, listen to this, it says, farmers who buy Monsanto's patent Roundup Ready seeds are required to sign an agreement promising not to save the seed produced after each harvest and replanting them or to sell the seed to other farmers. So once they've, they, they've planted seed in the ground, they can do nothing with that the next year. If their, their food produces more seed, they can't use it. If they've got leftover, they can't use it. Perfectly good seed, they have to throw away. It says that the 
This means the farmer must buy new seeds every year. Those increased sales coupled, coupled with ballooning sales of its Roundup weed killer have been a banana, bonanza for Monsanto. But it's getting even crazier, church. As the seeds are now patented, they have control of who uses the seeds, who grows them, and who sells the fruit from the seeds. So if a farmer gets a batch of seed, listen, and it happens to have one of their seeds in it, and they grow it and sell the fruit and get caught, they'll be sued. Think about that. If a farmer keeps his seed that's left over from the prior year, you know, the good seeds that he rightfully paid for, he can't use those previous seeds in the next season. They have to destroy them or they'll get sued. If a farmer plants a farm, listen, a farmer that, that has, he plants a farm and the wind takes some seeds. Listen, you're planting your own seed, not even from anyone else. You're planting these seeds that you've had, whatever, you're planting them in the ground. Let's say a wind comes and brings someone else's, your neighbor's farm seed, into your crops. It says that if some of those seeds that fly into yours were owned by Monsanto or other companies like, or maybe even a bird that picked up some seed and it's flying across your crops and it drops in your field, if you begin to produce fruit from that, even if you don't know it, you can get sued and lose it all. It's hard to find it online, but many farmers in America have been put in jail for these very things, for not using the seed they've been told to use. In 2008, it said that Monsanto was spending $2 million a day on research. Farmers make money by reusing the seeds he gets off a plant for after a season is over. Not anymore. And it's gone so far, like I said, the government can even arrest people for planting the wrong seeds or stealing the seeds that belong to the creator of the seeds. God was very clear about seeds. Go with me to Genesis chapter 1. Hopefully I don't have to tell you where that one is again. Verse 11 through 12, Genesis 1, 11 through 12, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seeds. Hmm. Let the earth bring forth grass. Let the earth bring forth these things, the herb that yields seed. Let the earth bring forth the herb that yields what? Seed. And the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. Whose seeds, what, is in itself. Now, you don't realize when you just read this how many times he goes back over it over and over and over again. Seeds, 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 seeds. He says, and the earth brought, it says, whose seeds is in itself on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind. There it is again. And the tree that yields fruit whose seeds is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, why in the world did God put seed in there so many times? He could have just said bear fruit. He could have just said let it, let it bring forth herbs. Let it do this. But over and over again, let the earth bring forth grass. The herb that yields seeds and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seeds is in itself on the earth. And it was so that the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. What if the church was ready in season and out of season? What if the church, listen, here's what's so crazy. How many of y'all remember Y2K? Some of you young ones are looking around like, what in the world is that? Y2K, I mean, computers, it was done for. And, and when they're telling us this, I'm, you know, I'm young and I'm scratching my head. I'm like, I ain't too smart, but my computer rolls over and it says 2001, 2002, 2003. But you know what we did either way? We still prepared just in case. 
I think that was probably the greatest preparation time that we've seen in our, our lifetime, that people prepared for the worst to come. So what would it hurt knowing that we could run out of toilet paper? I mean, think about it. The, the world went crazy because of toilet paper. And there were people's houses that I have gone to during these times. And you wouldn't believe the toilet paper I saw there. And they were the same ones that were upset that people were hoarding toilet paper. And if you did that, don't get mad and quit because I talked about toilet paper. But what I'm saying is, is people prepared even for the things that meant nothing. They prepared for things that, that, that didn't really matter, and we prepared for this, and we prepared for that. But all of a sudden, in Y2K, what do we have? We had barrels of water. We had food stocked up. We had all this and that. We had generators. We had this. We had gas. We had everything because we had no idea what tomorrow held for us. What we're doing, we were being prepared in season and out of season. And now we've gotten to a place that everything is so comfortable and everything's so easy again that we prepared for nothing. But what if tomorrow held worse results than what we were planning for in Y2K? We, we've seen already in this nation, literally, we've seen the power that, that they have in this nation to say, we're shutting your business down and you can't go to work. We've seen them slaughter cows just because they want control of the farms. We've seen them kill chickens because they don't have anybody to process them. We've seen so many things take place over the last year, and I believe the church has still been so comfortable that there's no preparation. Now, am I saying be scared for tomorrow? Absolutely not. But God says to be ready in season and out of season. If it came to tomorrow that you couldn't eat food, have we done anything? If it came to tomorrow, I mean, I mean, even the things that you'd never think of, the chips for cars, the chips for cars, and they've made up three different excuses that, that they've come up with about these chips and why we don't have them. I'm like, how do we keep coming up with a different excuse? But they've had so many different things. Listen. Right before the whole food thing, before they started killing the cattle we saw during the COVID, they were killing chickens because they had no one to process them, all these things. God had shown me a dream. He showed me a famine in the land, and I saw some sick animals, but then I saw a bunch of healthy animals, and they couldn't be eaten. And I'm going, God, I wake up from this dream or this vision I had, and I'm like, God, I don't understand why are there healthy animals, but people can't eat them. And then all of a sudden, within a few months later, we start seeing there's no people to process the chickens. We have to kill them. There's no one to, to do this. And all of a sudden, we start seeing the government and different ones the far, buying out farms and cattle. And, and we're shortage of meat, but they're killing cattle just to kill them all. And I was like, wow, it began to make more sense. And I start thinking about where we are as a church. And I think about all the hype that the church is bringing forth about this next season. Should we be hopeful for a great tomorrow? We should. But the church has gotten to a place that we've just relied on the saying, well, God will take care of us. He does. But he also tells us what to do to be taken care of. He also gives us ways and gives us ideas and gives us things. You know, God said that he gave us the power to create wealth. Well, but the key word was to create it. Not to just be given to us, for us to actually do something. And as you all know, one of my favorite scriptures, if you don't work, you don't eat. And I believe that, that we've got to get to a place as a church, listen, that we've got to start seeing the big picture of what's happening in the world and in our country. 
the big picture that they are slowly, and maybe it may not be tomorrow, maybe it'll be years down the road, but we see the process of what they're doing. We see the process with the seeds. We see the process that, that, that farmers are going to jail. We see the process that they're getting sued. We see the process now that they're going, if I want to make a living, here's what a farmer does. If I want to make a living, I've got to make money. And if I want to make money and compete with the other farmers and I need my living and my crops to grow, I've got to have something to kill the weed and kill the pests that are coming upon it. So now I've, in order for this to work, I've got to buy their seed too and their stuff that kills it. So now all of a sudden it becomes a monopoly that they're to a place that they've got to make their living and they're selling out to these things that before you know it, all of a sudden it's all there. So now if they want to keep making money, you can only sell it to who we tell you to sell it to. Now we're getting to a place in this nation that we're, we're hearing over and over again, even about the vaccine, that they want to make it mandatory. Whatever your beliefs are on the vaccine, so be it. But here's the deal. Why are they trying to force us to take it? We've had other things in this nation that have killed more people. We have more things now that are killing people than what we're going through. I mean, we've got suicide rates that's gone up. We've got overdoses that's gone up, but we don't seem to care about that. I mean, they're, they're coming to a place now that they're saying, if your neighbor seems like an extremist, you need to call this hotline and turn them in. I mean, this is true stuff happening in America. If they seem like an extremist, you need to turn them in. We, we know that, that Bill Gates wants to, to eliminate, he said this years ago, he wants to eliminate, figure out a way to eliminate the extremist part of a Christian's brain. And now they've just come out with studies that they've figured out a, a protein or something they can inject into your body, go into your brain, and control parts of the brain. And then we hear about how they're wanting to mandate things. And even if the vaccine's nothing, well, it's about the control to get to the mark of the beast. It's about the control to, to get some. Like I said, if you've been vaccinated, this has nothing to do with that. But what I'm saying is they're trying to control everything because we've got to step back and look what they're trying to do. That is, they begin to control the food, the, the, the seed. They begin to control the animals. They begin to control this. They begin to control that. They begin to control all these very things that next thing you know, we'll get to a place like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or that you've got to bow down to what we're telling you or you won't live. But then, why is it we aren't seeing change in God's people? Why is it that I want to be respectful? But why is it that the preaching of most of the preachers that we hear out there, there there's no humility coming? They'll, they'll quote the scripture all day long, but there's no change in the heart. It's still about what we can get rather than what we can give him, or maybe on their point, what you can give him. But we go through all these things and we continue to see the same thing, but there's nothing about really the repentance. And when there's repentance, there's a change of heart. And when there's a change of heart, there's a new person that begins to grow inside of you and take place and eliminate the old man that was once there. Because all of a sudden when Jesus comes in, he's not sitting there sharing a room with the devil. He's not just says, where God is, sin cannot be. 
And, it, and it's talking about habitual sin. So why is it that I've seen so many different individuals go into to church and talk about how exciting their church is and how, how fun their church is, but there's no conviction over their lives and nothing changes? That we've got to get back to the roots and get back to the way Jesus had it. Jesus went into the temple and he said, enough's enough. I'm tired of the garbage. We've got to change the preaching in here. That it's not about you. It's about my father and his will being done in here. And then if, listen, if we're going into church and church is about us making money and about us, what are we bringing to the world? Church is to come in to worship God, to get filled up, to get equipped, so we can go out and do what God's called us to do. But we've, we've perverted it, that church is about come in and your life will be blessed and you'll, you'll have your, your best life now and, and all these things. I've said before, if this is my best life, that means I'm going to hell. There's a, a righteous anger that starts bubbling up when you're seeking the face of God. There's a righteous anger that you start getting fed up with the garbage. You start getting fed up what's going around everywhere. I, I, now, don't get me wrong. There are some great preachers out there right now. There are some great ones standing up for God. But you know what makes me even more sick is it's not the preachers that are, are, are putting out this filth, but it's that the people in the congregation that are continuing to sit there week after week after week and sponsor the filth that's going on and continue to basically bow down to what they're saying because that's what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear I want to hear people when they leave this house say man my life's been changed I don't want people to come up and just say man you just make me happy every time I come in here <laughs> you're just so funny I mean, what's that doing for you? If you want something funny, go down to the comedy club. If you want something funny, go turn on Andy Griffith. At least that's pretty clean. But what's being, I couldn't imagine what's being, while we were, before we were pastors, while we were looking for a church, one of the most disgusting things that I had seen in church was when a pastor gets up with thousands and thousands of people in his congregation, that the pastor gets up and starts talking about when he turns on the TV and him and his wife are sitting there and they're watching something and it's filthy and it's dirty and all of a sudden they're laughing about it and all of a sudden they, they hear a voice that begins to tell them, you know what, you need to turn that off. You're Christians. You shouldn't be watching that. I mean, me and my wife are like, well, amen. Yeah. Finally, preach it, brother. And then all of a sudden he goes, you know what? He goes, we grabbed that remote. I was like, yeah, praise the Lord. We're going to like this church. He goes, and we grab that volume button, and we just turn it up even louder. I looked over at her. She looked at me. We need to leave, but I'm thinking I missed something. Why did I think I was missing something? Because the entire church was shouting and clapping their hands. They were all, yeah. He goes, you know what that is? People like to preach and say that's conviction in the Holy Spirit. He goes, no, that's the devil trying to condemn you. He goes, we grab that remote, we turn it up even louder, and we laugh even louder. To filth on the television. Whatever happened to watch what you put in your ears and watch what put in your... And that's what's being preached in the church today. I've taken my men, men's group to another state on the cross of the other part of the country... We've sat in, in a men's meeting for leaders. We sat there in the filth and the garbage that came out of the speaker's mouth that even the baby Christians with me said, let's go, I'm out of here. Yeah. 
We drove across the country to get there, but the filth coming out of the pastor's mouths was so bad, and people were laughing hysterically while we're getting convicted and feel like we're getting eaten up inside because the devil's in the room. We go into lobbies of churches, and they got your Ja Rule playing in the lobby with the F-bomb going on. And here's what the leadership meetings teach you. Well, we call it a sinner-friendly place. We call it a seeker-friendly place. That way, when people of the world, they come in, they feel at home there, and they, they recognize the music for what they listen to, so it feels comfortable to them. And then we can just give them a little bit of taste of the truth so that they leave coming back wanting more. A taste of the truth? Why don't we give them the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. But we're just going to give them a taste. Don't give them the full thing. Get them wanting more. And like I've said this before, the people of the world are tired of what they've had. The people of the world are searching. When you're searching for something, do you search for what you already have? You don't search for something. I mean, now sometimes I'll go, where in the world did I put my iPad? It's in your hand. Oh. But what? You, you feel crazy. Oh, my gosh. It was in my hand. Where are your glasses? They're on your head. But what? You realize that you shouldn't search for something you already have. And, and then all of a sudden now the training that, that pastors go through, through other leadership conferences from the big churches, you've got them and you're, they're telling you, well, here's the deal. We just want them to feel comfortable. We want them to come in to feel this way and that. And that way they feel at home when they're there. They didn't like what they felt at home, so they're looking for something different. Why are we giving them what they already had? Because I have something that will make them feel at home that they'll love, at home that they never felt back there. Then all of a sudden it comes in and it begins to change their life. That I want to plant seeds that will take root inside of them and begin to grow the Holy Spirit in them. That will take root and begin to change their life forever so that when they leave this place those around them say you're no longer the man that you were before you went to wherever you went and wherever you went I want to go because I don't like who I've been and who I am and I want to be somebody different like you have I'm telling you what when I changed my life for Christ and I finally made a decision God I'm going to serve you no matter what it takes I'm telling you what it was painful at certain times but you know what the people around me they saw it but they didn't see the pain they saw what was in me standing up through the pain. I mean, I couldn't believe. I mean, I felt insulted so many times when, when guys, men, strong men would come in and go, man, if God could change you, I know he could change me. I'm like, what are you trying to say? Was I really that bad? But, but things, they, they'd see a change and it would get, listen, the change in your life gives hope to the people around you. What happens in you begins to help change someone around you. I don't want to tell about a God that I've, I've met and a God that I know, but they don't see anything changing. All they know is what I've said. Right. People should know you by the fruits you bear, not what comes out of your mouth. The people should see a change happening. Listen, you go, well, I've been a Christian forever. There ain't much of a change that can keep happening. I'm telling you what, that means there's probably a lot of change that needs to take place. Because all the time, I want to look back every year and go, wow, I'm not the same man I was last year. I want to look back and say, wow, God has taken over more of my life. Wow, I've given, I'm telling you what, I'm telling you, even, even when it comes to things, when you begin to get rid of things, all of a sudden you find yourself getting more things. I don't care about it anymore. And God says, well, now I can give it to you. Because you don't idolize it. You don't put it before me. I heard one pastor say, this is recently. I don't even know why I call them pastors. I guess because they're pastoring their sheep off a cliff. He said, you know, years ago, God spoke to me. And he told me if I do these certain things when building my church, he said he would make me famous. He goes, and now look at me, I'm famous.
I have come so ye shall be famous. I remember scripture that says that he wants all the glory. What does it have to do with us? And then people get excited when a preacher preaches like that and they start applauding and getting all excited. I mean, what, what's sickening is, it's like the, the, the guy that, that talked about turning the volume up to the perversion, the applause that they got. I'm like, man, you, you talk the truth, you don't get the applause like these guys get. But what's happening? They're worshiping him. And we've gotten to a place in our nation, listen, that we truly don't know what tomorrow holds. It could be great. Listen, things could literally start turning. I mean, we've heard the prophets say August 20th, Donald Trump will be president. If you haven't heard it, Google it. Could it happen? It might. But one thing that I do know is, if we don't know what tomorrow holds, let's start just seeking the face of God and seeing what he's telling us to do. Let's start preparing. Listen, let's just start preparing for our future with him. You know what the greatest way to prepare is? Is get on your knees, seek his face, and say, God, I need direction from you. I mean, things could change completely. I mean, overnight things could change. An explosion for God could take place, and, and Jesus returning could be decades or centuries down the road. I mean, you got to think during the Great Depression, they had to have thought Jesus was around the corner. During the Holocaust, you know good and well, they're going, Jesus is coming, where's he at? I mean, things could go any direction right now. But one thing I do know is when we don't know what the future holds for us, it begins to strengthen us. It begins to get us to a place that says, God, I just want to be where you are. I mean, think about it. You got a kid, right? My daughter... We were here late last night. Thunderstorm, I guess it wasn't too late, but thunderstorm starts taking place. You hear different things shaking on the building. I'm telling you what, she's starting to get scared. I heard something over here. I think I heard somebody talking. I heard this, and she's coming up right behind me, standing behind me. No, I'm, I'm staying with you. I'm staying with you. I'm like, I got to go to the restroom. I'm not staying out here. I'm like, I'll go in a stall. You can stay right over here. And she's like, I'm not, I, I hear some, some, somebody's talking out there. I hear stuff. Like, it's just a storm. All of a sudden, the lights are coming on and off. Things are happening. You hear the speakers popping, and she's hearing all kinds of noises. But what did she know would protect her? Staying close to the Father. That even in the midst of the storm, as long as I stay close to the Father, I'll make it through it. As long as I stay close to the Father, I'll fear not. But as soon as she thought that I was leaving her, as soon as she thought I was getting a little too far, what'd she do? She'd start going faster. And I believe what God's calling us is even in the season that we just need to follow after him because scripture says that he goes before us to prepare a way. He goes before us and makes the crooked path straight. He goes before us, before us to our enemy, and he fights the battles before us. But guess what? If we're not following him, we don't get to endure. We don't get to receive the promises and the blessings that are there before us that have been said before us because they're all conditional on the obedience and then all of a sudden when we begin to say daddy all i want to do is be close to you father i'm staying close no matter what it takes distractions come things happen all of a sudden even my daughter you know she could get distracted Ooh, a keyboard let me go play the keyboard thunder comes what's she doing she's running back to daddy the power lights start going out she gets scared Coming back to daddy. What happened to 9 11? The church started getting scared. And what did it do? It started drawing people back to daddy. And then all of a sudden, things got comfortable again. Things looked like everything was great. And now we're worse off than we were then. But what could be happening is even if it doesn't go too far, what may be happening is God saying, I need to pull the people back into me. As no man comes to the Father unless first I've, I've drawn him. That it says that, that God draws you. And I did a whole, a whole sermon on to draw means to actually pull. 
Sometimes we feel like we're going through some hard times. Sometimes we feel like, but maybe it's God pulling us back to him. It says to resist the devil and he will flee. What does it mean? It actually means to apply pressure. So, so all of a sudden, when we're being drawn to God, we're being pulled. When we're resisting the devil, we're applying pressure. And then all of a sudden, we feel like we must be in the wrong place because things are hard and things feel rough. Well, maybe God's just saying, I'm pulling you back into me. What if this season, things could turn around, but first God's saying, I need to pull my people back into me. What is God saying? I want them to start getting close to the whisper. I want them to start being, I mean, the still, small, still voice. I want them to get to a place that they can hear my voice and recognize. He says, my sheep recognize my voice and they follow me. And then it breaks my heart that my sheep recognize my voice and they follow me. And it breaks my heart when I hear the church saying, I don't recognize the voice of God. Where are the sheep? But how do you begin to recognize the voice of God? By saying, God, here I am. Father, I want a relationship with you. When you begin to get that relationship, you begin to recognize his voice. As you begin to draw near to him, he says, he draws near to you. He's not running away from you. He's waiting for you to draw near to him, and he's drawing near to you. And he begins to listen, and you begin to listen. You begin to have a relationship. And before you know it, you get excited to get back to the place with your father because all of a sudden, you're you're abiding under his wings. You're abiding there with him that you know he's protecting you and he has you. And that all of a sudden now, as you begin to think about the future and as a a pastor like myself begins to preach about what the future holds for us, all of a sudden we get to a place that there is no fear about it. We're just saying, God, okay, what is it that you want me to do? What How shall I prepare? What shall I say? What shall I do? God, I want to get close to you so I hear more clearly. Father, I don't want to know what the false prophets are saying. I want to know what you're saying. God, I'm no longer going to listen to this and listen to that and listen to all these things. Father, I want to know what you have for my life. God, I want to know who the false prophets are. Because if they're saying something different than what I'm hearing you say, God, I'll know who they are, Lord. Father, I just want to be in your presence, God. Father, I want to be where you are, God. And if you're in the storm, Lord, I want to be in the storm too, God. And if you're going through this and you're crossing the mountains and you're on the other side, God, I want to be wherever you are, Father. Father, if it looks in the natural like the blessings here, but you're over there, God, I choose you over what looks like blessings, God. If it looks like I need to be here, but you're calling me here, God, that's what I'll do, Lord God. If you speak to me, something but it looks foolish to the natural it looks foolish to man god i'll know that i want to be where you are god and i want your wisdom not man's wisdom father god and father i will follow after you all the days of my life and i'm telling you tonight church it's time that we start seeing the big picture of what's really going on so many christians saying oh you're just worrying about this or that i'm telling you what What happened in the day of Noah? Noah. There was just one. All the other ones were saying, life's great. Life's going to get better. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. It's okay. You're just a worrier. He's like, I'm not worrying. I'm just preparing. There's no worry here. God told me what to do, and I'm doing it. And all of a sudden, it gets to a place. I mean, this dude looks foolish. I mean, he's mocked, probably persecuted. I mean, who knows what they've done to him? Who knows how many times he went to bed and got back up, and he goes and boards are off the boat. All my boards are stolen. I mean, you know good and well. I mean, there are people of the world, the people that thought they were right, but they weren't listening to God. And all of a sudden, he's saying, all I'm doing, I don't care what the rest of the world's doing. I'm the one. I don't care what the rest of the church is doing. I've had many mentors and different people in my life telling me how to grow a big church. They are completely right. But I'm not here to grow a big church. I'm here to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if people want to hear it, they'll come. And if they don't, they can leave. 
But what I believe is that when you preach the truth, all of a sudden it begins to touch hearts. I also know what God spoke to me. And he said that he's preparing things. He spoke to me several years ago, and he said he's giving the Saul's, and I'm leaving you with this, he said he's giving the Saul's of today a second chance to repent. He said, if they don't repent, he said, I'm going to give what I've given them to the young Davids that I'm raising up. I'm telling you what, all I want to do is be right where God wants me to be. All I want to preach is what God wants me to preach. All I want to say is what God wants me to say. All I want to be. You know what I've noticed? Even like my family, they all moved to Florida. Tell you what, I would like to be anywhere else but misery. But you know what? I'm only going to be happy where God's called me to be. And God's called me to be right here. And that's where I want to be. And if God calls us out on the streets to do stuff, that's what we'll do. If God calls us to have underground church, that's what we'll do. And, I, and I'll go into all that at another time. I'll keep you here all night if we get into that. Because you all think that'll be easier than it is. It ain't. But I'm telling you what, with all this being said, I just leave you with this church that start preparing for tomorrow. And if whatever that preparation, that preparation may just be that you start really seeking the face of God. That preparation may just be that you start getting rid of things out of your life that aren't Christ-like. Maybe the start of the preparation is going, and every, in the day, every day of your life, you just wake up and go, okay, what I'm doing right now, would I be doing this if Jesus was walking with me? What's coming out of my mouth, would it come out of my mouth if Jesus was walking with me? I used to think that as a child, man, it'd be so much easier if I was one of the disciples and Jesus is right there. And then I grew up and realized Jesus is right here with us. Right. Let's pray, church. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this night, God. I thank you for this time in your house, Lord. Father, I thank you that you've told us <laughs> how to get through things. I thank you that you've given power, given us power and dominion, Lord God, authority, Father. Father, I thank you, God, that you prepared a way for us even before you made us. Before you formed us, you gave us everything that we needed to survive, God. And Father, I thank you that even after man fell, that you sent away the Holy Spirit, that we could get back to where we were that I believe we truly can have dominion over everything that crawls upon the face of this earth and everything in the, the waters, God. I believe you've truly given us this authority and this power. I believe that even during droughts, we, we can command the seeds to grow, Lord. I believe that you've given us power over everything, God. The only thing that it takes on our side is faith and obedience, Lord. And I thank you that you've given us a measure of faith, God. And tonight, Father, I ask that you've, you've stirred up the hearts of individuals, you've stirred up the faith, God, that tomorrow even individuals will say, you know what, God, I'm going to start stepping out in faith in a greater way. I'm going to start doing what you've called me to do. And Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your people. We call them blessed, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. And everyone in this house shouted, amen, amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand clap tonight.